Hey everyone, welcome to the show Off the Record. I'm Aram Mukumuf, the host. Thanks for tuning in. On this show, I'm interviewing well known CEOs and VCs about how to spend the money that you raise effectively and what mistakes to avoid. My guests have been in the trenches and have lots of practical advice to share, company stories, failures, and successes. As a founder, you'll hear what you can do better when raising money and after you have raised the money, all in a 30 minute conversation. And if you happen to be a VC investor, you're also in the right spot. You'll get to learn from your peers. This is episode number 15, and I'm joined here today by another great founder and CEO. Uh, Brennan is the CEO of a company called Soapbox, a Toronto-based startup. He was 2015's Ontario Young Entrepreneur of the Year winner. And two years ago, his company switched from being a sales-led organization to a product-led one. Uh, Soapbox makes software to give employees a voice. They work with folks like Facebook, Intercom, Netflix, Lyft, and Walmart. Brennan, it's awesome to have you on our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh man, pumped to be here. Excited to uh, dive into the chat, help out wherever I can to the audience. Cool, cool, thank you. Um, so I'll kind of just jump into it. When we had a chance to connect uh, before, one of the things that you said really kind of stuck out to me. I wanted to kind of explore it a bit, a bit more. So you said that when you're creating, so, well, since you're also going through the process of fundraising and you have before, you, you have a lot of experience, obviously, to share about this, this topic. So um, one thing you said specifically that I found to be quite humorous was create a deck uh, for your uh, VCs, your investors, that a drunk investor can look at on their Uber ride home. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about some of that a bit more and uh, get, so get some of that. It's kind of flippant, but, um, but uh, honest, right? Like, um, you know, I guess the concept really comes from, and I'm a more of a product guy at heart and, and, you know, the first front end UX UI guy at the company and, you know, still do a lot of that. And, um, I guess, I guess the concept maybe originally comes from like the drunk user test, right? Like, you know, if your, if your user users are drunk, can they still figure out how to use your app? Right. Speaking of Uber, like Uber is a great example of an app everyone can figure out when they're drunk, right? Um, but uh, but but I think that's uh, I think that's the, the the concept is is I think as founders, it, we care so so much about our business, we care so so much about our vision, our mission, all that stuff, and because we care so much about all of that, we care so much about all the work that we've done, and we care so much about all the work we want to do. Sometimes it's hard to condense all of that into uh, a pitch. And I think we work really, really hard to get all of that information down to like a 20 minute pitch and we build it into these decks and we send the decks out. Mm -hmm. The reality is the the purpose of the deck is really to get you your next meeting, right? And for the most part, uh, I, I think during a fundraising process, it, it starts with like an email intro that says, cool, send me the deck. Yeah. I think as founders, we overestimate how much attention we get when we send that that PDF attachment or whatever the heck you're sending. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I think part of that is, is, is trying, wanting to, wanting to impress, wanting to convey how cool your business is. Um, uh, when instead, I think what you want to optimize for a little bit is just, is, is kind of the just extreme clarity and conciseness. Like, mm -hmm. like, like really when people first glance at your, your presentation, it's like, you know, open, load, flip, 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 cool, okay, yeah, yeah, let's have a meeting. So like, do, will you pass that test? I think that's the first thing that you want to do. And, um, you know, it, this goes for like a Y Combinator application all the way up through, uh, honestly, like, um, if you look at any of the S1 filings, like the S1 filings are, are dense with information for a public company. Yeah. But the media blitz that surrounds it isn't, right? It's headline. What's the headline, um, right? And, and uh, so I think there's a lot of things that you can do um, with text and words and imagery to, to do a good job of that. And I'll tell you, like, I'm terrible at it, right? Like, I think one thing I learn every single time I go through this process is like, I start with Google Slides. I add, you know, a whole bunch of things. It's maybe 25, 30 slides, but it's probably got enough information in there to be, a hundred slides. Um, and then I'll show it to friends and, and board members and stuff. And, you know, the, the last time I did this, uh, one of my, one of my favorite board members was like, I can tell you right now, 
this business is uninvestable based on this presentation. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I, oh crap. What have I, oh man, what have I done? Uh, and uh, so I booked a follow-up call with him like an hour and, and, and um, the, the, the feedback he gave me was uh, like very low value feedback, right? But it was basically like, we looked at the slide, what's the point? Like you have three words, what's the point? Okay, that's the point of the slide, cool. That's the title of the slide. What's one image, cool. Make that image, the whole image, done, next slide, right? And like, that's about as much attention span at least as you have at the start. And, and, and obviously when you're there in person or you're there on a Zoom call or you're, you know, you're actually jamming with someone, you can, you can fill in a lot of details and impress them in a lot of other ways. But like, you gotta pass that test first. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's the idea. <laughs> And so like over time of having done so many iterations of your deck, what's like the kind of main key takeaways that you would recommend to any founder who's going to be going through like a, a seed round, uh, you know, for the first time, like three, four recommendations that you would, you would give. Um, okay. So a very first time fundraising, I think is different than, than future times. I think you learn a lot because you're able to prepare 12, 18 months in advance for your next fundraise. Mm -hmm. um, and I think your first time fundraising, um, uh, you know, you, you almost have to figure out a strategy in retrospect, right? Like, um, you know, you're at a certain point in time, you need to fundraise, um, you have certain results, right? So I think you've got to go through and pick, pick the results that are great. And kind of spin a narrative, a narrative as to why they were great strategic decisions, right? And all of the ones that were bad, uh, I think you have to spin a narrative to say why those were strategic decisions to leave them bad for now, you know, so that you could fix them later. Whereas I think, um, you know, if you're not going through a fundraising right now and you're planning on it in the next eighteen months, you can make those strategic decisions, right? Um, and and um, be have a consistent narrative with investors for for the next eighteen months, and they'll just look at you and, and look at the numbers and be like, "Wow, this this person was right." But I think the first time through, I'll keep using drinking analogies. Like, here's what was helpful for me um, the second time I did it, or no, maybe the first time I did it. Um, like skipped dinner, like skipped breakfast, lunch, you know, have a late dinner, and at the end of the day, you're already a little bit cranky, like have like one or two beers now you're a little bit like cranky but also like joyful loosened up yeah <laughs> and just write a letter to yourself and i think the letter to yourself is like why why is this business super exciting to you and why is this business utter trash right wow. and i think you'll give you'll i think you'll likely in that scenario write yourself a a, a letter that's honest um and probably slightly more negative and so all the negative things you see in that letter the next day, mm -hmm. um, you're going to want to be able to concisely explain away, right? And concisely, I mean, like you have that seven second attention span. So, well, why, like, why, if an investor says, well, like, um, you know, why is your cost of acquisition so high? And you can just say, um, we decided to not focus on unit economics um, during this stage of the business that you might have been trying to make your cost of acquisition low for the past 18 months i don't know but like you've got to you've got to spin that narrative that's super super you know as honest as possible as strategic as possible so that someone is like oh yeah that makes sense why the heck would you worry about unit economics in the the you know precede stage of a business cool yeah next why is right why is ltv so whatever right um, and then all the positive things, I think you want to spin it into a story that says, hey, strategically, we believe this is the best way to attack the market. And, you, you know, that might be true. Um, that might also just be like the way you stumbled into success or, or how much success you, you've had. And so I think you're going to want to be able to, to tell that story without sounding like, well, we just stumbled into this like thing and, you know, we're stupid, but we survived. Um, I think you want to say, hey, we're really smart. We know what we're doing. We're experts in the space. We decided purposely to make these decisions in order to set ourselves up for success in the next round. Um, let me walk you through those things and tell you how your money is going to change things uh, for the better, much better, right? Um, and so that would be like, if you're in a situation where you can't go back in time or you can't think, you know, 12 months ahead and, and have those, uh, make those decisions, then I think you, you've got to have like an honest conversation with yourself. And I would think about glass of wine, no food, 
write a letter to yourself. Uh, keep, it honest, keep, it real. keep it honest with yourself and then, right. And then build a deck uh, that, that can pass the, uh, the, the tipsy test and an Uber ride home. There's too many drinking analogies. I don't drink this much, but I, I think they work. <laughs> I think they like, I think they help convey the point. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's, that's great. That's great advice. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, next, the next thing I wanted to discuss was um, kind of operational cash uh, as a, as a, you know, managing that as a startup as a startup, as a founder, as a CEO. Yeah. Um, so there's like a few well-known CEOs, like the CEO of Zoom. Yeah. Um, I know even the CEO of Slack, Stuart Butterfield. Yeah. Um, they had tons of cash, you know, from organic revenue. And, um, you know, the opportunity was there for those two CEOs to like raise, raise money. Um, but, uh, you know, they all kind of said, well, what, you know, with the case of with, uh, with Zoom, he's like, well, actually, I didn't spend a dollar of my Series A until the next round. Yeah. And with like Stuart Butterfield, he said that, you know, we don't need the cash like at all. We don't need it. But, yeah. you know, it gives us just like a lot more runway or whatever. Like it's just like for a rainy day kind of thing. Um, so f in those kind of situations, that's kind of going against the grain, you know, with reasons why most people raise money sometimes. Um what's your perspective on that? Like, is it something that you went through personally? Is it something that? Yeah. Buy? I think you have to keep in mind too, that like, um, you know, Sewer Butterfield, Slack and, and Eric and, and Zoom are, are probably more like outliers than, you know, uh, anything else. And, uh, you know, in, in a variety of ways, right? Like Stuart didn't need the cash. He had a lot of cash personally, right? Um, uh, and he raised a uh, series B for his video game, you know, glitch that Slack was born out of that no one ever talks about. So like, you know, here's a guy who could raise a series B for a video game that didn't, I don't think launched, um, you know, a lot, not a lot of people could do that. Um, but yeah, if you sell your last business for a billion dollars, you can do that. Or, or, or Eric was the VP of engineering, um, for, I don't know how he pulled this one off, but for his biggest competitor prior to Zoom, yeah. right? And he stole the first 49 engineers. They all used to work for him, right? Um, and he probably, and they probably didn't need a ton of cash either, right? They probably did pretty, pretty well. So I don't know how he pulled that one off, but he seemed to pull that one off. Um, so I don't know, like, hey, it would be great to replicate that, right? Um, but I think in order to do that, you're probably raising more money than you need at a, a nice valuation. And so, hey, if you're raising more money than you need at a nice valuation, yeah, only spend the money you need. Um, I think for most people, they're probably raising slightly less than they feel like they need, right? Mm -hmm. um, or just about the amount of money that they need. And so like you get a little bit more into the situation where um, you have to monitor cash, you have to be good at cash. And, and certainly um, the job of any CEO um, is, is cash. Uh, but certainly venture back CEO, it's, it's, um, it's cash and, and fundraising. If you're, you know, continuing to, to stay on the train track, mm -hmm. the way I think about it, um, and this takes time, I think to get good at is, um, you know, for the most part, your, your board, your investors, your VCs are, are largely finance people. So they can be very helpful when it comes to financing the business. Some of them have been past operators. Um, which can be helpful in, in helping you think through operations, but no one is going to care or know about the, 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 the bits of your business as, as much as you, right? Mm -hmm. And I think as much as the, the kind of the, the, the crazy whiplash effect that happens during a fundraising and immediately after a fundraise is like, you've just spent months of your life only focusing on the good stuff. You've probably even told people, you know, like, don't give me bad news now. Like, don't give me bad news right now. I don't even want to know it. Just deal with it save all the bad news for later. Um, and so you might even have inflated views of how, how you know, successful you currently are, right? And so uh, you'll come back down to reality probably hopefully after those things are done. But, um, but after once you have the cash in the bank, I think you have to look at, at this realistically. Do you believe you have product market fit prior to fundraising, right? Like, like immediately prior to you going out and fundraising, did you believe it? Because obviously to get the round done, you did. Um, you know, uh, your, your, I think ultimately your VCs, your board, they're in, they're partners now. So what you, what you want for that, you know, everyone wants this business to be successful. So they don't want you to lie to them. Um, they just want you to, to grow the business and, and you're going to know the best way to do that. I think a lot of people make two mistakes when it comes to spending cash. 
Um, so the first is, is obviously they spend too much cash too quickly um, and they think of it as an investment. Um, and uh, they do that in, in more or less, um, I guess in two ways. And, and so um, the first is uh, over hiring um, or like hiring faster than the team can realistically absorb. And the second one I would say is focusing on uh, new revenue um, uh, over top of successful revenue, right? And so like to unpack that a little bit, um, say you're a marketing team, you know, I was having this conversation today, like say you're a marketing team of, of one person, right? You might have money now to have a marketing team of five people, but like scaling your marketing out by 5X in the course of one month probably just means you're gonna waste a ton of money, time and effort, right? Like a, a five person team coordinated marketing effort is gonna take frameworks and decisions and things like that that are, are just different, right? Or a, say you're a three person sales team and you're, you, you now have the cash maybe to onboard and ramp up to be a you know, 15 person sales team. But a three person sales team is very different than a 15 person sales team. And trying to do all of that at once is, is maybe a little bit silly, but hey, we just promised all these big numbers. So we better hurry up and hire all these people really quickly and start burning cash really quickly so that we can start making a lot of cash really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think most serious investors who have seen companies become successful don't really care if you hit 10 million ARR, you know, December, 2022 versus January, 2023, right? Uh, they'd just rather you get there, right? Like if it's a, the difference is one or two months, who cares, right? Like most of these businesses go to zero. So make sure you don't do that. And I think, I think um, a, a lot of this also boils down to people are, like if you had to pick between two businesses, one which had, uh, you know, for every dollar uh, uh, of, of customers that you, you signed up, you made 140% um, in 12 months, or, uh, uh, you know, you, you got 100, you got to, to choose 140% more revenue tomorrow. Like most I think first time founders are going to choose, I want to, I want hundred, 140% more revenue right now. Right. And they kind of optimize a little bit for some of these short term things. There's almost like a panic of like, I'm so stressed about competition. I'm stressed about all these things. I'm stressed about the expectations I set, all that stuff. I think so many people choose scale top line revenue, net new or scale new revenue fast over everything else instead of choosing, um, you know, scale successful revenue. Um, and the one thing about Zoom and the one thing about Slack and the reason that they were able to do this is they actually chose the most ludicrously successful revenue over anything else. Um, and that actually allowed them to fund things. Like maybe it delayed, and maybe it actually delayed their success by a year. Yeah. But listen, like the, the, the 2015 cohort of ARR um, for Slack is now worth 10 times more than it was in 2015, like 10 times. Most businesses would love to 10x in that period of time, right? Uh, and they were able to do it just by not doing anything, like close that 2015 and make it successful, right? Now, obviously, they're able to stack a ton of revenue on top of that and become even more successful. I think the same is probably true of Zoom, right? And Zoom had a different customer acquisition method that I think allowed them to have their users do a lot of their like marketing spend and stuff. But, um, but I, I, I think as a founder, as a CEO, you've got to sit there and know how confident am I in the dollars I'm bringing in, right? And are they going to renew? But then on top of that, especially we're, you know, a lot of us are SaaS businesses, like, you know, in B2B, like they might renew year two just cause, right? And if you're only a two-year-old business, you might not know, like, hey, I just told investors my revenue retention is really, really great, but you might not know. The only person, who knows the truth as a CEO or founder, right? So, you know, are you, how are your user cohorts? Because like they might renew year two regardless because they're just, it's B2B software, but do they use it? Do more people use it now than day one? Did anyone ever use it, right? Um, and if you're sitting there and saying, hey, every single month at this company, people are using it more than they did, you know, the prior month, um, then 
you're going to be pretty confident that, you know, come renewal, they're going to renew. So I think you want to think about some of these leading indicators to revenue and focus on them, right? Like how quickly can you onboard a customer? How quickly can you get, uh, you know, this, mu this much usage or how quickly can you get people to aha moments and stuff like that? And, and treat those as like what I think of as like speedometer scale. Um, and maybe this is like counter, maybe this is what everyone should do, or maybe this is counter to like the, the, the Silicon Valley approach, but like, like maybe the decision if you're hiring salespeople is like, let's hire one salesperson a quarter until we get um, uh, payback uh, on a salesperson to six months. And then we'll start hiring two salespeople a quarter until we get payback, you know, back to six months or whatever, right? And if we keep payback on a sales rep at six months, then the idea is to, you know, double the amount of hiring we're able to do, you know? Right, like most teams can probably hire one salesperson a quarter, right? Um, but I think that's a smarter approach than if you're, say, a, a one-person sales team hiring four people tomorrow, right? Um, you're gonna burn less money doing it. I, I really love what you said there about, um, you know, uh, from conversations I've had, people always say that the reason you know some companies burn through their cash is because they just scale up too fast and they don't have a process, they don't have a framework. But I also feel like it's Sometimes there's a lot of push from what I've been told from the investors saying, you know, we expect you to increase your headcount by 100, by 200, depending yeah. on how much you raise, right? Yeah. And so like, as a founder, you have to make that bet. Okay, like, is this like a sustainable approach? Is it gonna, is it gonna kill me long-term? Um, you know, how do we ensure that we can continue cash flow without having to mm -hmm. be raised again in mm -hmm. eight months, right? How do you, how do you manage those expectations with a VC to tell them that, you know, slower than expected growth is good and here's why and um, kind of pace yourself than just like spend all their money. Well, I think you said a key word um, in this is like bet. So like, I, I, I don't think, you know, if your idea is to be venture scale, I don't think you also want um, slower than expected growth. I think you want to say like, um uh hey let's um be super focused on doing a good job in these areas and once we do a good job in these areas we unlock you know in, in a way like if you you know some sometimes like vcs finance people even do that they'll 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 say hey we're going to release the first tranche of your seed round here and the second tranche of your seed round once you mm -hmm. hit these milestones right like, I don't think this is necessarily foreign to them. You're just kind of adopting that practice and using it in your own organization. So you can say like, listen, um, you know, burn is at hundred K a month, 200, whatever it is, hundred K a month. Um, once we get burned to 80, we're going to unlock an additional 20 grand a month of spending. Right. Mm -hmm. And that 20 grand a month of spending maybe is going to be all in the sales group or not. Right. But like we want to manage burn here as well as manage growth. We want or we want efficient growth. Maybe the conversation is, in fact, we don't want any of that. We want super inefficient growth where we are burning the maximum amount of money in any given given month um, to create, you know, short-term artificial uh, pops of, of revenue. That might be the strategy. I mean, that seems like a really bad strategy, but that might be the strategy. And I think that's the conversation you would have is like, hey. You know, I think here's the state, and I think this gets easier just as as you get exposed to more of it, right? But like, you know, hey, I think the stage of the business that we're at right now is to to find really great unit economics. Mm -hmm. So I want to stay focused on that, and uh, the things you know we all seem to care about um, is getting you know these milestones for our next raise. I talked to a couple Series A or Series B investors. It seems like some of the thresholds, the trigger points for them to be serious and be interested in it is like you know, CAC to uh, LTV of this and a, uh, maybe a payback period of this and, you know, uh, this much of like pipeline growth per, per month or something like that. So those are the ones we're going to track and care about, right? And when we get our LTV to CAC, uh, you know, above that, then we feel pretty confident spending more to, to acquire customers, both in sales and marketing, right? Um, and I think they're going to go, damn, this person's like thoughtful about how they run their business, right? Now you and can say like, like, cash. <laughs> yeah. Like, Hey, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to protect your investment. Yeah. I'm not going to spend recklessly. I'm going to be thoughtful about it. And if I don't have a thought about it, I'm going to, instead of hiring people recklessly, I'm just going to spend that week figuring it out. 
Again, spend the week one figuring out some of these processes and some of these things. And instead of figuring it out after I've hired the people, I'm just going to spend the time and figure it out beforehand. Now, I don't think that's an excuse to say, I'm going to take one full year to figure these things out before I spend any money, right? Um, unless you're like worth a billion dollars already and like, you know, your investors just want to hang out with you and that's why they decided to put the money in the business. But I think that's that's part of it. And, and I would say like the, the reason I said bet, I think was such a good word is that's what you're doing, right? Like, like almost, you know, if you're of, of a company past like 10 people as a CEO founder, you can make three bets, right? And you're probably going to have to talk about those three things a hundred times over the next 12 months. And that's basically it. So sit back, think about what are the three bets we're going to make. And that's all I'm going to talk about for the next uh, 12 months. I'm going to put an astronomical amount of resources into those three things. And if I do that, it's almost inevitable that we're going to get better on those three areas. If we stay that focused, right? So maybe for you, it's hiring salespeople, maybe for you, or like for me, we don't have salespeople. So it's, you know, what's our activation rate in our product, right? What's our conversion rate, uh, you know, of our in-app upgrade page, right? Like if I put product people, design people, engineers on our onboarding experience for 12 months, it's going to get better, right? Like it's, it's, it's inevitable that it's going to get, or what? Like if it doesn't get better, then you just revert your change and try something new, right? Right. If you just measure people, you measure the team weekly on it, you report on the stats, you communicate that for the next 12 months, like, like most people are decent at their job. So if you're decent at your job, you're going to get better in those areas. We all claim that we're amazing hires. We all claim that we have the world's best team. So if that's true, then you should see astronomical returns on those areas. And I think if you pick the right areas, you put all your chips on those right areas. And those really are the the real levers of growth in your business, Mm -hmm. right? then you should see those, you should see those returns. Um, and I think what you want to do is like speedometer that scale. Part of this is like, um, you know, sometimes I think about like, even when is the right time to announce your fundraise? Like here's, a, here's maybe a, an interesting example. Like a lot of founders are like, like the day before the money hits the bank, they like send a, a press release out and they're like, we just raised all this money, right? Um, I think for seed stage companies, that that's probably the wrong time to do it, right? Like, you have some sort of product market fit. Your website is probably out of date. Your onboarding experience probably needs some tweaks. Like maybe raise that money, change, like update the messaging, fix the onboarding thing, and then announce the raise, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and you're delaying that announcement, um, which really is going to be delaying the signups increase, right? By like, what, two, a month, Right but hopefully your rates are better throughout it. So I think it's just more about being a little bit intentional with um, you know, the opportunities you're afforded. So I have a question on that. I, it was, I, I always like asking this question, but as a CEO, uh, when you raise you know, a round of funding, say it's like a seed stage first time or whatever, mm-hmm. um, what is something that people like, you, you, you gave a good example there of um, you know, going and fixing all the things that you know are broken and yeah. then announcing it to get yeah. all that eyeballs, the traffic to your site, right? But um, what are some things that they should start doing with their capital that they're not doing right now? Um, um, I'll get, I'll pick one thing I think that is often overlooked by first time founders. Um, and, um, the, the, the capital is there to grow your business. Um, but I, I think one thing people often overlook is, is, um, what type of work gives uh, the irreplaceable people energy, right? So c- call it founders or call it founding initial founding team, but there's certain work that people do um, that gives them energy. And, and that's like a growth loop in itself. Like if you're doing work that gives you energy and makes you excited, then you, then you don't get burned out, Right and you work harder and you work better and you're doing high value work and it's you're, you're pumping things out the door all the time. I think you're going to want to make sure your highest paid people are, are, are doing that um, and that you're doing that, right? Because this is a marathon and, and, and if you, uh, you know, are constantly uh, taking kind of the, the menial crap tasks, right? Like we joke about this as founders all the time, like, you know, I'm off the floor, 
right? Like, you know, I took out the trash, I'm the janitor or whatever, right? Because it shows you care. But at the same time, like your salary is not worth doing that, right? And so if you get enjoyment out of it, do it, right? Like if that gives you more energy to show up early the next day and do other work, great, do it. Um, but if you're, if, if doing certain things in your business, uh, like maybe it's, it's, um, maybe it's some of the accounting stuff, or maybe it's some of the model building stuff. Like maybe you're not that type of person, or maybe, you know, talking to customers drains you because you're way more introverted than, um, than, you know, the typical Silicon Valley, uh, CEO. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really good use of funds to find someone who's energized by that and have them do that role um, uh, versus doing what you think you should do. Like, I think should is a very loaded word, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's kind of guilt tripping yourself into doing some of these things. So like, you know, it, it, you know, maybe a good example of that is like, you have a CTO who's like a builder and they're really, really good at product innovation and building and getting things out the door. That's like technically, um, you know, hard to do and also, you know, able to do it at an incredible speed. And then you're like, oh, well, you're the CTO. So can you do the shred claim in Canada? This is like a Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> can you do the shred claim, <laughs> SRED, whatever thing? And it's like, you know, that makes sense for the CTO to do, right? But it sucks. It's awful. I've never met a CTO who likes doing it. Um, it's a total waste of time and it's all backwards looking. And like, yeah, I guess like you can save some money on your engine, but just like maybe, maybe, maybe like have one of your eng managers do it and have a consultant do it and have your CTO like ship product. And, it, or, or like a, a different one is like, you know, maybe there's like some, some customers um, that uh, you know, you've, you've, you've got to deal with on a weekly basis. And it's like, you know, it's, it, it's killing you because your, your CTO, your CTO doesn't want to do it and he's got to do it. Wow. And I had this conversation the other day, this is going to sound terrible, but um, I think it's worth thinking about is like, you know, the conversation popped up. And it was like, should we let, should we give it this task to this one engineer? And then the manager was like, no, that all, they don't, they don't, they don't really like doing it. It'll burn them out. Right. Um, uh, and you know, we don't, we don't really want to burn them out. It, here's, here's a thing I think you have to think about as a board member, right. In your own company, does it make sense to give that task that no one likes doing to the most experienced, most highly paid person on the team who, if they burn out and quit, you're fucked as a business? Or does it make sense to give that task to the person who's new to the team, um, relatively inexpensive in comparison? Um, and if they burn out, this sounds horrible, I don't even wanna be quoted on saying it, but if they burn out and quit, you survive, huh. right? And I think, Sometimes as founders, we don't make the, the board member call and we sometimes take too many hits on the team to yeah. kind of answer your question like quickly, right? Like one thing I think once we have this cash that we do a bad job of doing is uh, spending that cash uh, to get rid of these horrible, painful things that we have to do, right? Um, and sometimes what we do instead is we take the thing we're good at and we give it to someone who's not good at that, right? Like the CTO is great at product innovation. Cool, let's hire a PM, a designer, and an engineer and have them do product innovation. Like, you know, maybe that's what Square does or maybe that's what Facebook does or Microsoft does or whatever. And maybe that's the thing that someone wrote about in a blog one time. <laughs> like, hey, this one process you have works, right? Maybe your CTO doesn't like writing tests. Like maybe you should have your junior devs write the test for your CTO. I don't know. Anyways, so I'm not I'm not advocating for that, but I think as examples of, of, I, of that, I, love it. I think yeah. it's I think it's very true and very accurate. It's a depiction of some things that I I sometimes don't <laughs> do well either. Me so, too. Me too. Yeah. By the way, it's, it's tough. You know, we always want to take those hits on behalf of the team at times, and you know, take on those things that people don't want to do just to keep them happy. But like, it just bogs us down. Like, and I think it's worse to bog you down yeah. than it, one member of your team. Like the impact of you being low energy for a week is worse than the impact of, of, of a member of your team being low energy. Um, and I'm not saying like, always choose them, yeah. right? Like sometimes the right call is to take a hit for the team. Like sometimes Elon Musk has to sleep on the factory floor. Like sometimes <laughs> that has to happen, right? Yeah. I'm not advocating at all to like, you know, 100% of the time pass it to the team. But I, I think that. you should ask yourself that question, right? Yeah. If you are the best salesperson, maybe stay the best salesperson. 
uh-huh. right? Or maybe if you're the best engineer, maybe say the best engineer. Um, and, and just be cautious of when you tell yourself, I think I should, right? Like when you hear the word should, like consider, well, should you? Like, should you really? Um, you know, especially if you have cash to spend, does it make sense maybe to spend 10, 10K now and, um, you know, give that to someone who, you know, is, is, is different, you know, than mm-hmm. you, I don't know. A um, couple more questions, Brennan. Thank you so much for all this great insight. Um, I wanted to ask, because you're going through the process of, of raising now and you have a lot of experience, what, what angle put in as your narrative when you're uh, explaining you raise, you know, is it product? Is it revenue? Is it past success? You know, how do you make your company look more attractive to those investors? So, um, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, ultimately they're investing because they believe this, you know, or, or they're looking for businesses that, that will be more valuable in the future. So I think you have to tell that story. Mm-hmm. Um, the way you tell it, I think, can differ depending on the, the type of business and, and the go-to-market approach, right? But like for the most part, they're finance people. They work in finance, right? Like we work in tech, we work in startups. Um, you know, as VCs, they might use tech, but they, they're not working in tech. They're not managing engineers. I mean, like, you know, maybe maybe some of the, the super big funds are, right? But um, for the most part, they're, they're partnerships. They're not corporations, right? For the most part, they're in finance, not in tech. Um, so I think you have to appeal to the finance side of your brain, right? When you're telling the story, like when you say that, um, you know, you have really, really good um, activation rates uh, of your users and, and, and you have great Dalmau and you have, uh, you know, cohorts that, that last uh, 24 months, um, you know, or your, your 90th percentile and in, in B2B SaaS, whatever. Like when you say some of these product things, like what does that mean from a future revenue standpoint? What does that mean from a revenue potential standpoint? So I think you have to spin and twist it that way. Like to give you concrete examples of some of ours, um, we have really, really high down now, right? And what does that mean? That means that like four to five days a week, the people who use our software, um, you know, are using our side, they open it up. It's part of their job. It's a day-to-day thing that, you know, similar to a CRM that they use. Um, I think you're going to want to start anchoring yourself to industries that have high multiples. And you're going to want to start anchoring yourself to say, listen, if they use it four to five days a week, you know, it's not a nice to have, it's a need to have. And, you know, that means that, you know, you can charge more per user. And if they're using it and it's a collaborative tool that means they're going to invite more users and that means that we get to charge more and so your expansion revenue is going to be higher as time goes on and obviously you're going to want to prove out some of those things so you know have a slide that says natural revenue like i have a slide in our deck that says natural revenue expansion without a sales team and then the next slide says um adding sales to further expand revenue expansion and it's just you know one chart is is uh you know revenue um uh, cohorts by month and the next chart is an example of a customer where I did a sales call myself um, before and after. And it's like, like natural revenue extension before, one phone call from Brennan, right? Natural revenue extension before, after. And then the next slide, how many more potential? And you're trying to induce some greed. So even though we don't have a sales team, even though we're, we're very product led, I think you're, we're still making a pitch that we have revenue now. Yeah. We're, we're going to have a lot more of it soon. Um, and here's what we need to do. You know, we're looking for your investment to do some of those things. I think ultimately that's what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I'll say is like, I think there's a, a decent framework. I think this is like a David Scott framework for like, let's think about what stage you're in. Right. And, and I think stage one of a business, and this might be seed stage or around the seed stage is like, how do you make successful customers, right? Successful customers use your product a lot. They spend a lot of money on your product. They have high MPS. They uh, refer your product to other people. They're willing to be testimonials. Refer your product to other people. They're willing to be testimonials. They're willing to whatever, right? Um, once you feel like you've come up with a consistent process to, to create successful customers, then work out a consistent process to create profitable customers, right? And then I think once you do that, and I think this helps you with your raise, like, you know, a seed stage raise can be like, look at how we've created a process that creates successful customers, right? Here's what we're looking to raise money for is like, we want to scale that. So we have a lot of customers and, you know, we're worth tons more money, but we also want to um, scale that in a way that's uh, unit economic efficient, right? 
And when you go out to raise your Series A, you're like, look how unit economic efficient we are and look how successful our customers are. Now we want to, um, you know, if for every dollar we spend, you know, we make $2 um, from customer revenue. We just want to spend a lot of money to do that, right? And that can be your Series A. Um, and by the way, we want to figure out all these, um, you know, we have all of these concepts that are really, really strong for defensive modes, right? Yeah. So we want to scale um, and, and, and do that. And I think, I think those are some of the stories that you want to tell, but ultimately like, you know, they're, they're finance people. So I think you have to, you have to appeal okay. to the finance nature of the, the conversation. Okay. Okay. Um, last question for you, Brennan, uh, in a, in a minute or less. Yeah. What Good would luck. you advise a 28 year old old self? Um, be, oh, 28 year old self. I think, um, it's such an interesting one because you pick, you pick <laughs> age, specific year. not like two years ago or five years ago, whatever, like 20, um, 28 year old self, uh, you know, there's something about turning 30 where you just become like much more comfortable and confident and I think in your skin, right. And like you're, you're much, you know, more able to stand up for like the bits and pieces that you believe in versus like what you think you should should be, be like be cautious of should at 28 um i think that the advice would be um build i was kind of already on this path but i think like build the business that you want to to that you're very fucking proud of that you're very proud of that there's like not an inch in your business that seems like it's someone else's business right and like, maybe that sounds, I, that that's coming across, like, I want to be the king of my own kingdom. I don't think that's true. I think like, you know, I believe very deeply in product led growth. Like I believe very deeply in it. So like, that's, that's our strategy, partially because I think it's um, you know, the right strategy for the type of business we have, but uh, you know, partially because I just believe, I like violently believe that's the way businesses should operate in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was really hard for me at, say 27 to be leading a sales led team and actively avoiding people, sales reps who were trying to talk to me. Like I would avoid sales reps at every possible chance I, I could put as a CEO of a company. And then I would hire sales reps to try to sell CEOs of other companies. And I think that was just like, a, you know, um, that was kind of the impetus for me to say like, hold on a second, am I building a business for five years ago or am I building a business for five years in the future? So I think I would, I encourage myself on that on that journey. Okay, cool. It's great parting words. Uh, thank you, Brennan, so much for uh, participating on our show. Uh, for everybody who's going to be listening, this was another off the record episode. Uh, it's a new podcast with the goal to build a community of founders and VCs around it so they can make be better businesses together. Uh, so thanks again, and I'll see you next time. So thanks so much, Brennan. It was great yeah. having you. Thanks for having me.